I'm Emu Shalev, and this is a very special epilogue to our first season of A Book Like No Other. Now, we ended the last season with a grand story. The one tree has been transplanted in the New Eden as the Israelites entered the land. But look, you and I know that's not how the story ends. Because being in the land, that didn't last very long. Eventually, once again, we go into exile. And not just one exile, right? We're brought back into the land in the second temple period. And again, there's an exile. It's sort of frustrating. Edens and exiles, exiles and new Edens. And knowing that sort of sullied the whole walk off into the sunset moment that we had at the end of our series. When God feels far, when the tree is a withered bush or even less than that, how do we bring the tree back? That's the question Rabbi Foreman and I want to tackle in this epilogue. What we decided to do was to look at something really strange in the Torah text itself. So much of the story of the five books of Moses is about the expulsion from Eden and the reintroduction to the land. But the Torah itself anticipates the problem we're struggling with. It anticipates the problem of a new exile. And it's pretty wild. But Moshe tells the people right before they're entering the land that exile is actually looming in their future. Moshe predicts that the people will again find themselves in exile. But then he teaches them the way back. And he does that in Parshat HaTshuva the portion of return or repentance. So what we want to do is take a look at that section with you right now. I think it has a lot to tell us about the cycles of Eden and exile, of the tree and the Torah, and even how it applies, not just on a national scale, but in our own personal lives. By the way, Parsha Tachuva should not be foreign to us. We actually visited this chapter once before in the series. It's the place where Moshe actually equates the Torah and the tree where he says that he placed before us Chaim and Tov, life and good, death and bad. So I think it's pretty elegant that the solution to our problem will be found in the chapter that first told us about how the Torah is one tree. By the way, this episode is a little bit different. Rabbi Foreman and I read the chapter together, verse by verse, discovering insights as we went. Old school Chavrusa style. We want you to feel a part of that with us, so I'll be jumping in less with narrations. Please let us know if you like this style or if you miss me. I won't be hurt if you don't. And if you can, I really encourage you to open up to Varim and read along with us. Either way, I hope you find Moshe's words as insightful as we did. Let's jump in. Okay, Nemo, so here we are with the end of Deuteronomy. Israel's been cast out into exile, basically evoking, you know, PTSD from the garden when we were cast out from exile. And we're on our way back into a new garden. Mm -hmm. And what this is portending is that there will be times in history when this happens. um, And somehow the new garden is always there for us. And the Parsha Tshuva is uh, giving us a map almost for how that access takes place. So um, let's see if we can work out the details as we go through it. Why don't you take us through and see what you find? Okay, great. So I'm going to read. I'm going to pay careful attention, see what we notice. So here, Deuteronomy 30, verse 1, um, and it will be when uh, all the things that we just talked about in uh, the past few parshiot, kitavo, uh, the blessings and the curses, that I have placed before you, right? you should return to your hearts amongst all of the nations in which um, I have driven you into, right? So it's talking about when you're in exile, you need to return something to your heart. What exactly are you returning to your heart? I don't know. But if you just have to give the simplest possible reading for it, what do you think it means? That when all these things happen to you, i.e. when the curses happen to you because you're in exile, right? And you shall return to your heart. Like, how do you understand that? Yeah, I, I think um, there are two ways that I want to understand it. I think probably one way, which is not literal, is to is return the commands to your heart, um, like remember your the commands. But I think that the, probably the more uh, appropriate way of reading this is Vashevot mm-hmm. al is you should return to your own heart, mm-hmm. right? Maybe um, you've ignored your heart. Right? Maybe you sort of, your heart has turned to stone or you, you've somehow ignored yeah. um, that part of you. And uh, the homing beacon, the way back, is to actually return to your heart. Yeah, to get in touch with your heart. And that, I think, is the simplest way to, to, to really read it. This has nothing to do with God, 
right? It has nothing to do with tshuva as you and I understand it. It doesn't say that you'll return to the mitzvos. It doesn't say that you'll return to God. It says that you will return to your heart. Now, it could mean that you will take heart or that you will take it to heart. In other words, you'll meditate upon what's happened to you. But the deeper meaning of it, I think, is as you suggested, that in meditating about what's happened to you, you are in a way returning to your heart, as if to suggest that one of the consequences of exile has been a kind of alienation within ourselves. Okay, uh, next uh, verse. Vishavta ad Hashem elokecha. And you return until Hashem your God. I would take out that word ad, right? Vishavta, I would say, Vishavta el Hashem elokecha, but here it's ad. It's almost like you can return up until God. Vishamata bekolo. And you will hear his voice. Kechol asher anochi mitzavcha hayom. As all I am commanding to you today. Ata uvanecha. You and your children with all your heart and soul. Yeah, it's what's noticeable is what's not here, right? As you pointed out, I'm returning until God. That suggests, like, I'm not all the way there. Almost like if you learned calculus, the idea of limits, where you, like, keep on trying to get to mm-hmm. that y-axis, mm-hmm. but you never quite get to that y-axis. And there's always something infinitesimal that keeps you away. Why the hesitancy? You know, if you're doing tshuva, just go all mm-hmm. the way. Return to God. Do his commands. What is holding you back? I think shame might be uh, holding you back. Um, I think fear might be holding you back. Okay. Uh, it's really hard to do tshuva. It's hard to just, oh, I've seen the error of my way. I don't know anybody who's ever done that, actually, who's said, oh, I've seen the error of my ways. And especially if you look at that first verse, which is really just a euphemism for saying, right. when all of these klalot happen to right. you. So then that's like fear and shame squared, right? Multiplied into what we might call trauma. <laughs> So in the aftermath of trauma, it's like, you know, I might try to return to God. I don't know mm-hmm. if I'm getting there, right? I might try to do God's mitzvah. So there's these interesting stages. It's almost like stage one of trauma. What does trauma do? We might say trauma puts me into a place where my heart and mind are separated from one another. By the way, I was reading this guy, Bessel de Van de Kolk, who's an expert on trauma. That is actually how he defines trauma, if I'm not mistaken. The way he puts it is it's a separation from the mind, from the senses. So your senses are telling you certain things, but your mind doesn't believe it or doesn't compute it. So there's this alienation of the mind from your heart and the rest of your body. Really, all of therapy for him is this, this one phrase of a hashevata wabavacha, right? That's it. Therapy is how do I become a whole human being again? What he says is the talk therapy doesn't go very far. He says, you know, it goes far, dance, choreograph dance with people, right? Getting involved in a community and doing things together as a whole human being with mind and heart all together. The things that unify our experiences of mind, heart, and body. You start bringing together the parts of yourself that were like torn away from each other with this trauma, and somehow that's going to lead you on this path back to God. That's a beautiful concept. I think I remember listening to that after you uh, you mentioned that I should check it out. But applying it here is, is really remarkable. The argument is that um, exile is traumatic, and that would make sense to bring about the uh, almost like the purely knowledge of good and evil view, right? The command to do tshuva, you'd imagine that is being entirely cognitive, right? Go and recognize that you were wrong, recognize who is right, and now keep the commands. But the body keeps the score. Right. So actually, that's not mm-hmm. um, necessarily going to be a successful way of doing chuva. And it's certainly not a whole way of doing chuva. You need to actually first return to your heart. Um, you actually need to to uh, get in touch with perhaps that trauma, perhaps. Uh, right. You got to do something that's not head based. Um, and then there's this bridge to Vishavta Ad Hashem You still are not expected to look God in the eye. 
Vishamata Vikolo, you're not even, again, you're not relating to words yet. You're just relating to voice. And we talked in this podcast about this dichotomy between God's voice and his words. So the same way that you were saying that it's a getting back to a preconceptual part of myself, getting back to my heart. What's interesting is that when I'm coming back to God, I'm also not getting back to a conceptual part of God. Mm -hmm. I'm getting back to a heart part mm -hmm. of God. I'm getting back to his voice, but I'm not getting back to his words. What do you make of the fact that in this verse, you have two uh, as ifs, right? You, you don't return to Hashem, you return ad Hashem, like until God. And also, it, I would have wrote, Vishamata bekolo bechol asher anochim et savchayom, right? Here is voice in all the commands that I'm mm -hmm. commanding you. It doesn't say bechol, it says kechol, right? As if, or like. And what does that mean to you as I'm commanding to you, as opposed to what you would have thought it would say, which is? Not sure what you mean. What if I said to you, Emu, construct a, a verse in Hebrew or English which has the following elements returning to God, listening to his voice, and God's commands. And you should keep the commands. Is that what it says? No. It's saying you should hear his voice like I'm commanding. Yes. Like I'm commanding to you. So even though we have the words that which I command you today, the verb is missing. Exactly. Because this has nothing to do with God's commands. In other words, if you were traumatized, and because of you were traumatized, you stopped keeping religion, and you didn't observe the Sabbath, and didn't do all of that, this level of tshuva is not keeping the mitzvahs. Because it doesn't say, listen to his voice in as much as you do his commands. It says, listen to his voice as I've commanded you to do. In other words, the command here is, but I specifically don't want you doing my mitzvahs now. What I'm really interested in you in is just focus on my voice. And let me ask you back in Eden, if this mm -hmm. really is getting back to a kind of Eden, what does this remind you of back in Eden? Well, actually reminds me of them hiding from God's voice, right? Where God's voice actually exactly. is strolling in the garden um, and, and they hear him and they hide. Exactly. So that's what God says I don't want you to do. Right? This is stage two of tshuva. Stage one is get back to your heart. Stage two is get back to my voice, which is don't worry about what I say. Just don't mm. be afraid of my voice. I don't know what, what you make of this, but what this is reminding me of is another time when Israel was uh, bearing klala, so to speak, and they were in a communal trauma in the land of Egypt. And if you think about it there, like there's no mass tshuva. There's no like... And the people of Israel repented and saw the error of their ways, right? What actually happened is, seems to be like, maybe describing this, right? They, their hearts, they kind of like end up feeling something at one moment in the Exodus, right? When things are really bad, they allow themselves to actually even feel their trauma. Uh, and it's when uh, the king of Egypt dies and they actually don't seem to cry out to God directly. But the way the verses describe it is that, um, Vatal uh, Shavatam El Ha'elokim. It's almost like their their cries end up reaching mm -hmm. God, um, even though they weren't actually. Mm -hmm. In other words, what you seem to be saying is is that in our worst, most traumatic moments, one of two things happen: either we scream to God, and a scream does not have a cognitive mm -hmm. element. Go back to Exodus. Vayis Aku. They screamed. It wasn't like they had carefully crafted words, which they said, God, please look down and please, right? They screamed and their voices came up to God. It's much more visceral. And if you listen to God's response, what was God's response to those screams, right? If you actually go, those, those are the words right before the burning bush, where the burning, the turtle goes out of its way to suggest how deeply God was affected by those screams. Right? Remember that language? Yeah, I remember. Yeah, first of all, it's, it's Vaishma Lokim and Nakatami. He hears their cry. Then there's, it's, he doesn't just, he's not done. There's more verbs. Vais Kor Elokim et Brito. He remembers his relationship with uh, and his uh, covenant with the forefathers. And then there's this en enigmatic phrase is Vayar Elokim. God sees, right? And we, we have a whole course on, on this, the three science course, which is incredible, where he sees et B'nai Israel. Which and Vayeda Elohim and God knows, right? He actually uh, and we 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 demonstrate I think fairly convincingly that he sees their trauma, he sees the ways in which uh, the Egyptians who tried to cover up their suffering, God actually 
bears witness to it. So if I had to summarize that verse in my own words, I would say the people screamed and God heard with all mm -hmm. of himself, with all the different aspects mm -hmm. of himself. Now go into our verse in Deuteronomy 30 and look how reciprocal it is. We're in verse three now, and just like in Exodus, where we have God respond in kind to the emotional outcry of the people, Rabbi Foreman notices a reciprocal relationship here, too. And God will uh, return you from your captivity. Um, and he'll have compassion over you. Vishav, again, returning. Who will return? Let's see. Vishav Hashem Elokecha et Shvusra. God's returning your captivities. Yes. So now look at the whole picture. It started with what kind of return? Me returning to my heart, followed by me returning until God. And now God is reciprocating that with his return. So both of these shavs are God? Yes. We did two shavs in verse two. And now God's going to do two of his own in verse three. Got it. Veshav Hashem Elokecha et Shvutra. And God will uh, return you from your captivity. Veshav, and he'll return you. Vekibetzcha mikol ha'amim. And he'll gather you uh, from all the nations that God had previously scattered you to. This is a great undoing, a great returning. Now, how would you relate, Imu, the kind of return that we do to the kind of return that God does. Does God's return mirror in its nature the kind of return that we did? <laughs> well, now that you say it that way, I'm gonna look at it a little carefully. Um, well, there's the first shav um, that we do, which is returning to our hearts, which may parallel, I guess, God returning us from our captivity. And there's the richa mecha, which is compassion. So, I could see which so. actually is a function of one's heart right so god will mirror your return to heart with almost like a return to heart of his own right in the sense that he will display a kind of compassion and compassion is a function of the divine heart and the second return the second return is bringing you back in from all the, the nations where he has scattered you by Rabbi Foreman's logic, this second part of God's return is supposed to mirror the second part of our return in verse 2, to return Ad Hashem, until God. With all your heart and soul. But I didn't see the connection. How is that parallel? To see it, think about the distinction between individuals and community. How should we return as individuals if trauma separated aspects of yourself? You have to reclaim your heart, you have to reclaim your nefesh, and you have to reclaim all of it. You can't leave any of it behind. You don't have to get all the way to God, but you have to get up to God with all of you. So now, the way God reciprocates that is on a macrocosmic scale, as each individual does that, right? So then when God will return and unify all the scattered aspects of ourselves writ large, at the community level. Mm. Oh, I understand. So in as much as a person is gathering their various pieces inside themselves and returning, God is doing that on the macro level. But where do you see that a person in their return is gathering the different parts of them? Is that v'chol avcha v'chol nafshecha? Yes, because first thing to happen is my mind is separated from my heart. So if you have to cognize what's in your heart, right? Bring your mind back to your heart. That's hashivat al mm -hmm. But you don't have to take heart and mind together and nefesh, mm -hmm. which is some other aspect of yourself. And then you have to bring all of that, not just all three of those things, but all parts of all three of those things, all not leaving any of your heart behind, right? The whole of avcha, the whole nafshecha, with all of these powers. And the return that you are doing is unifying aspects of yourself walking towards mm -hmm. God, right? So God says, mm -hmm. you do that, and I'll return you, the nation, right? The nation is scattered. It mm -hmm. has all of its pieces all over the place. I will bring those back. That's beautiful. There's a lot, a lot there to unpack. Uh, first thing it makes me think of is just the double entendre of nafshecha, right? Which is your heart is split from your 
soul, your, your life force. But that word of nefesh is referred to often as people, to lives. The shivim nefesh yardu mitzrayim, right? Like there were 70 souls that went down. So God's saying, if you can gather your individual soul, I can gather the communal souls. Yeah. Picking up on that thought, actually, makes reminds me of the New York Times uh, Daily podcast. So the New York Times did a little series on school board wars. You know, really painful thing to listen to. There's a school board swing vote person who resigned in frustration. Yeah. And at his moment of greatest frustration, he said, this COVID trauma has broken you all. And it has caused such division among people who used to be unified in the interests of trying to do the right thing for our kids. And it's created these two ideological warring camps who do anything to bring down the other side in the name mm -hmm. of doing the best for our children. But our children are actually suffering because the schools aren't getting mm -hmm. the attention they need to do what schools actually do, which is to educate kids. Instead, they just become pawns in this ideological war. And this notion that one of the terrible, tragic effects of trauma is that trauma can take something that's one and shatter it into many. It can do that at the individual level, when it can take a person and shatter the parts of them and say, brain, you go over there. Heart, you go over there. Body, you go over there. Every live in their corner and cower. And tragically, it can also mm. do that at the communal level. It can take a community and pulverize them and put this one over there and that one over there and everyone cowering in their little corners and seeing that we're not on the same team. We're like fighting against each other. And God says that if you can see your way, towards mending your internal self as individuals, then I'll see my way towards mending your communal self and bringing the parts of you that are alienated from one another back together. I wonder also, there's an intuition in communal wars that if, if I just convince you of my way of looking at it, of my politics or of my religion, then the community can unite. But actually it seems like God is showing us that concepts don't unite. You actually can't start with the conceptual level. You need to start in the level of heart or the level of voice. That's fascinating. Right? Fascinating. Yeah, that's a great point. Which which is not intuitive, right? Like uh, the and I listen to that uh, daily podcast also, and the, at the school board, right? They they have this town hall structure, and and everyone is just trading concepts. Like, no, we, this is what I believe. No, no, this is what I believe. Right? Where <laughs> imagine. The school board needed to do, they needed to do communal dance yeah. before. No, really, that, before. that actually would be the answer, which is that everyone shut up, right? And we're going to turn on the music and literally it, let's move yeah. in tandem with one another. And it, it, and it's almost like at the deep core of what Bessel de Van de Gork was talking about, he's talking about how two things have to happen once on the macrocosmic level and the microcosmic level. The way you get your heart and mind and body together is to get community together. If I can be connected at the communal level and the community can come back together, I can be connected at the individual level and my mind and my heart's can come back together into being a whole human being. I want to go back to verse 2 for a quick second. Veshavta ad Hashem alokecha, this verse which puzzled us, this notion of returning until God, but not completely to God, is paired with, at the end of that verse 2, Bechol nafshecha, with all your heart, with all your soul. Now, from your basic knowledge of the Bible, right, give me a verb that goes with Bechol nafshecha. What would that verb be? To love God. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking Shema. Veshavta Hashem alokecha, Bechol nafshecha. Yeah. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul. So notice that in, even though we have the signature words, which take us back to Shema in Deuteronomy, we don't have the mm -hmm. antecedent that goes with in verse 2. We don't have love. Yeah, you're, you're not commanded to love. You're not commanded to love. And you're not, at this point, you're not feeling love. So what's interesting is that this Shuba process, strangely, doesn't have love in it. You do have Shema, though. You have listening listening to God's voice. You have the whole love, God, Shecha, but strangely, you don't have love. And I wonder, Imu, if one of the reasons for that is because the whole nature of trauma is to be a pulverized self, and love doesn't work that yeah. way. You can't love like that. 
right? Love is Love's not possible yet. Right. Love isn't possible when you have an isolated heart, right? And I wonder mm-hmm. if that's why at some level you have a Vashavta Ad Hashem Alakaha. What's holding you back? It's holding you back because you can't feel love. Mm-hmm. Right, which is a function of trauma. Also, uh, just I, I feel numb. What I what I love also about what you're saying in, is the transition from verse two to verse three, um, which is you're returning up until God, and you're using you know all your capacity of your heart and soul, and then God sort of sees that and says, "All right, you you didn't get all the way to me, but I'm going to still return you, and I can still have compassion on you." So he's not expecting the love quite yet, and he's still motivated to act. Yeah. And now let's get to verse 6. We are jumping ahead two verses. So quick summary of 4 and 5. God will bring us back to the land from all corners of the globe and make us even more prosperous than our forefathers. So at this point, you're back in the land, and God's doing good to you and making you greater than your forefathers. So you're thinking, what else do I need? I'm good. Right. Why doesn't it all end here? Like, I'm back in the land. What am I missing? I'm back in the land. I try to get back to God, listening to his voice, right? So no, something else is going to happen. Umal Hashem elokecha es levavcha ve'es levav zarecha. God is going to circumcise your heart and the hearts of your, your children. Le'ahava es Hashem elokecha bechol levavcha u'bechol nashecha leman chayecha. Okay, so God is circumcising seemingly to make it possible to love God with all your heart and all your soul, so that you will live um, or thrive or whatever Laman Chayecha means, but I'm thinking tree of life here. Mm-hmm. So this this actually seems to really resonate with what you just said, which is it wasn't possible up until this point to love God and God's making love of him his problem. He's going to somehow, right? Ma, to, mal Mila is to remove a foreskin, to remove a barrier. Yep. Trauma created these calluses, desensitized my heart that, that I couldn't really feel. So God says, I get that. I get that. So your job is get as far as you can. You can unify the aspects of your brain. You can passionately desire to be in a position where you could love me. That's all it is. That, that's the most desire that you can muster. I wish I could love, but I just can't. And I feel so dead. So God says, okay. That's good. I'm, I'm with you. I'll help you there, right? You've taken your step. I'll take one more step, right? I'll remove that barrier. And now the energy that you're bringing, the all your heart with all your soul can, f- soul can flow into its natural place, which is love. Beautiful. Yeah. And then here, this is really interesting. Lama'an chayecha. It doesn't say so that you will live. Laman Chayecha is for the sake of your life. To me, that's really interesting terminology. When I hear those words, for the sake of your life, it's so that you can have a life back. I mean, think of not being able to love. I don't have, I literally don't have a life. It's like the time. You're living in black and white. But if you can do this work of bringing your mind and your heart back and coming to God and saying that, that with passion that this is, what I want, but I don't know how to get there. God can remove that barrier for you, for your life's sake, right? To enrich your life. And this gets back to this idea that we've been coming back to over and over again in this course, right? Which is this notion of what did the tree of life really mean? Was it supposed to make you eternal, right? Or was that just the supposition that if you could chop down the tree and consume it, maybe you could get eternality out of it? But the actual purpose of the tree was not to make you live forever, but to make you live a mortal life in connection with immortality, because that enriches my life in all sorts of magical, magical ways. And God is saying here that if I can bring love back into your life, I do it for the the sake of your life, making your life a meaningful thing, because a life without love is not really so meaningful. Beautiful. The quality, the color, the lifiness of your life will return. Yeah. Next verse. 
so God will sort of deflect or, or turn um, all the, the curses that um, you have experienced that 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 you've previously experienced onto your enemies and those who hate you and the ones that have persecuted you and are currently you. pursuing you. Mm-hmm. Hashem, and you will return. So you think all that returning is done. Right. You're back in your land. <laughs> and, and you will now re- return. Hashem, and you will hear in the voice of God, which we already supposedly have done, but now something else is new. Ve'asita et kol mitzvotav, and now will you you will do his and perform his mitzvos. Asher nochi mitzav chayom, that which I'm commanding you today. Mm-hmm. As opposed to look back in verse two, at the beginning of this process, the, you could listen to the voice of God, but you weren't doing anything. Kechol asher nochi mitzav chayom, as I've commanded you today. Now you listen to the voice of God. Va'asita et kol mitzvotav, and you actually do the commands. Asher nochi mitzav chayom that I command you to mm-hmm. Well, that's a whole different world, right? Why? Mm-hmm. Because with love open, then performance of the commands is possible. It's really, it's a chayim first, right? Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's, uh, lemar'eh first, and then you can actually do all of the tree of knowledge stuff. You can actually do all the, the mitzvahs. Yep, yeah, exactly. Tree of knowledge always comes second, right? How you're going to live in the world, what, what right and wrong is going to be, is always a function of getting the basics of the emotional construct of your relationship with God right. And tshuva is about resetting those basics and then God helping you, right? And then the rest flows. And now, of course, you can have the tree. Do you think God's mirroring that? Like, notice that what he's doing is actually preserving your life. First, that he's, he's rescuing you from places where your life might be uh, threatened. Second, he's giving you land, which is a source of life, and Yerusha. Third, he's giving you chios, right? It says that he's going to circumcise your heart, leman chayecha. But if you look at what happens next, is after we then, so now that we did the life thing and then God gives us life, now we keep his commands and maybe God will give us fruits. Because t- take a look at the very next verse. Yes, look at, the, look at the next verse. What's the word that appears over and over and over again? Read it. God is going to make the actions, the, the works of your hand, great. What are those? Keep on reading. So the fruits of your womb, the fruits of your animals, and the fruits of your of the ground, Litova for oh, good. Oh, does this remind you of anything? <laughs> totally. We have Laman Chayecha, now we have Litova here. And we have it, we have pre Litova, the fruits of Tov, the fruits of Tov and Ra. Almost as if you're eating the fruits of Tov. And don't worry so much about the Ra, right? But God, the blessing is God's going to be feeding you these fruits. And when you eat them, they don't taste like fruits of Tov and Ra, they taste of, like fruits of Tov and Tov, right? Beautiful. You returned and not just listened to his voice, but did his deeds. And now God is providing these fruits for you. Why? Because he's returning. How is he returning? Keep on going. Ki yashuv Hashem. Lasus alecha letov. To rejoice over you. In good. Um, for good. Ka'asher sas alavatacha. The same way that he rejoiced over your forefathers. In other words, so now you have this new sparkling way of relating to God called love. And now God reciprocates that with this new sparkling emotion, Kaviachal, in his own world, which is joy. God will rejoice over you in goodness as he rejoiced over your forefathers. Do you, so do the you see emotional con- richness is, is, is now reciprocated. Do you see a connection here to um, the nature of the curses in Eden? When God cursed um, Adam and Eve, he cursed them, he cursed uh, Eve in the fruits of her womb, and he cursed Adam in the fruits of, of uh, the earth. And he gave them both um, um, itzavon, right? They both um, had the curses of sadness, right? Yeah, in a way, so all that's going away, right? The fruits of your womb are coming back, right? And are restored. The fruits of the land are restored. That's Eve's curse. That's Adam's curse. And when God rejoices over you in goodness, somehow the sadness that you experienced might be gone with the associated with those things might be gone too. Beautiful. What do you make of the, like if I were writing that verse as an inverse to, um, to the curses, I would talk about 
your joy. But what do you make of the fact that the, the, the joy here, the joy that's returned is God's joy? What do you make of that? That's a fascinating question. I was wondering about that. And I'll tell, tell you what, you know, my immediate intuition without knowing whether it's correct or not might be what this suggests possibly is that going back to the garden, why is it that you'd be sad? Because you severed yourself from God. And because you think God is sad. So here God gave you the ability to be a creator just like him, to have children, to create organically in the land just like him. And you'd think that that would be the most joyous thing in the world, exercising your creativity. But now that you're alienated from God and you disobeyed his commands, so God's not going to take away your ability to create. But every time you do, there'll be this gnawing sense of shame and this gnawing sense of sadness that I, that here I am exercising this God-given right to be creative like my creator, but my creator's left me and I'm all alone and he's he disappointed at me. Imagine how sad that is to sit here in my own room doing this great gift and I'm not even connected to God anymore, right? So what is it that restores my own sense of joy in these things, takes away my sense of sadness, is the understanding that God is taking pride in me and is taking joy in me. And that's what lets me create and enjoy. And I think, by the way, the same thing is true in you and our own children. You know, I'm old enough to be a grandfather now. You're still just having your first round of kids. So I'm a generation ahead of you in a way. But the one of the things I think that is really what grandfatherhood is all about is when, when you know, you have your kids, but when your kids get married, in essence, you're giving them a blessing that they should have kids now, right? And what's your job? My job is to be a grandfather that takes joy in watching you have kids. And that really gives the kids a tremendous amount of strength. The grandparents are right there behind me and are taking joy in my kids, right? The, the kind of chizuk it is that when you have a new baby and a new kid and you can show them on FaceTime to your father and, and mother and, that, and see their faces light up with joy, it kind of gives you the strength to change all those diapers, to do all those things. And it doesn't seem so mm -hmm. terrible anymore because there's this, this joy mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. been bequeathed to me by my own parents. And now I too revel in joy with my kids. I feel like they're part and they're there with me. My own creators have given me this gift of creativity and are with me all the whole way. And maybe that's what's going on here. That's fascinating that you're bringing that up. It's emphasizing, you know, we, we read these psukim and reading them really closely, but there's something that, you know, I, I may have like fuzzed up in my brain because it didn't matter too much to me when I was reading it. And it is the intergenerational themes, right? Yeah. Sort of you and your kids have to do chuba. And then God gives me this promise that when I was reading, I was like, okay, fine, I guess. Like, he's going to love you the way he loved your forefathers. Yeah. Right? Like, I, it's, a, it's like, okay, that's a nice promise, I guess. But this, the, the, this idea of parent and child is all over here. It almost seems like God is saying there's a special kind of joy right and and maybe it's this joy of acceptance or this joy of of finding your place in in the intergenerational line or or there's some in, incomparable joy uh like the joy of a parent turning uh to you and and finding pride in you and and accepting you and it gives you home it gives you place right in, in some way uh maybe um there's a psychological exile anytime a parent rejects their child um, and, and so what God is saying is at the really, at the height of this, uh, I'm going to rejoice over you, right? So the, the shame that you experience will be wiped away. Of course you will be joyful because to have place, to have parent smile at you and take you back in, right? What could be more yep. joyful than that? A thousand percent. Let's do the last verse. This is when you will have heard the voice of God to keep his commands and his chukim that are written in this Sefer Torah. Um, and when you return to God with all of your heart and all of your soul. Good. Let me point two things that I see in this verse. At the end of the verse, ki tashuv el Hashem alokacha b'cholav avchol kvanav shacha. How is that different than the right. first time around? 
ad and el are totally different. Ad means, right, uh, up until. And here you're actually returning all the way. This is God. what it's like to return all the way to God, right? This is how you get there. Mm -hmm. You're finally in a place to go beyond merely hearing his voice, but you can now actually keep the commands yes. and the chukim. If you can do that, keeping, in other words, it is a function of mobilizing both trees, right? I do need to get those emotions right, and God can help me get there. And then I do need to flow into actions and doing his will in the real world. And when I do that, my return to God is complete. That has to animate, right? Not just my wanting to return to God, but my love of God, that was earlier, and my actions, right? What I'm doing to respond to God. I need to respond to God with all of my heart and with all of my soul. And when I do, my return to God is complete. Sort of three levels in Chol Nafshah, Chol Nafshah, Chol Nafshah, Chol Nafshah be charted here. The desire to love and to return, actual love, and then actual doing needs to come with all of myself to these three places. So I'm afraid to ask you this question, but why, what do you make of the fact that, uh, I think often there's this emphasis in those who are working on themselves spiritually to focus on action, 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 and kind of, you know, hope that the heart will follow. Do you think that that's maybe not the best strategy? Seemingly here, the correct path for a quote unquote Baal Teshuva is actually really to focus on your heart and then the actions will flow. You know, that's a very interesting question. I hear the contradiction you're asking about. Um, I'm going to go on the limb. I'm going to make a, high, a distinction that I suspect is true, but I cannot at this time prove to you. And the distinction is it depends if you're talking about in the big picture or in the little picture. In other words, if I have no relationship with God whatsoever, right? If I am not even sure he exists in my life, have no idea what my relationship with him is ever, that is something I can't fake. I can't just do, right? If, if I act without the basics of any kind of love or respect for God, then, and I act, then the, what explains my actions, Emu? Why am I doing it? Why would I do all of these commands if I don't have any kind of love or respect for you? There's only one answer. Tyranny. You must be scaring the hell out of me. And that's not kosher, right? That's what we left in Egypt. God says, I know you had that kind of mm -hmm. king. I'm not that kind of king, right? So get your basic emotional structure with me right. I'll help you. You don't have to figure it all out. You don't have to come to me in love, right? You have to come to me to want to love me, right? I understand if you're traumatized, mm -hmm. I'm saying, right? But all I need from you, all I need from you is, is just to want to love. And I'll do the rest. I'll, I'll take away the trauma. I'll do all that. And then you can act. Then I think once you've got that straight, once you are an actor, because the big picture is right, right? Your love and respect is there. Then, right, if there are mitzvahs that you feel a little too lazy to do, there's mitzvahs that you don't know what exactly they're gonna do for you, or you're not quite feeling it one day when you wake up to daven, right? So then I think there's an idea, get in the habit of acting in those ways, do it, and then, the implications in the little picture of all the things that those actions do in terms of changing your identity will fall into place. You'll become the kind of person that the mitzvahs mold you into. So it's almost like a chiasm, hmm. right? Which emotions, actions, actions, emotions. Fascinating. That's very cool. And I appreciate that distinction. Just as someone who has friends who have, you know, gone off the derech, as it were, um, I think that distinction actually makes a lot of sense. I think um, uh, for some people who were raised with a certain kind of tyrannical Judaism, um, the ultimate disintegration of that Judaism made makes a lot of sense. And I've seen these people and been friends with them for decades now. And I, I notice how their hearts have moved and how open they are to acceptance of Torah that is less tyrannical, that is less... Um, uh, they, they've sort of come back around in their own way and found God in their own ways um, in a nechmad lamar'e sort of way without focus on the the uh, obligations first. Yeah, it's so amazing how, like, here is a parsha Zachuba, 
and it actually gives you a sophisticated emotional roadmap of how a real person who's struggling could come back, which is like mind boggling. Rabbi Foreman mentioned he had two points he wanted to make on verse 10. The first was that switch from Ad to El, returning until God, to returning to God. The second had to do with the beginning of verse 10. Ki tishma b'kol Hashem elokecha lishmor mitzvotav. When you will have heard the voice of God to keep his commandments. We said you're going to return, you're going to do God's mitzvah. But look at the difference between doing God's mitzvahs in verse 8 and doing God's mitzvahs in verse 10. Verse 8. You will return, you'll listen to the voice of God, and you will do all of God's mitzvah. Now look at the summary in verse 10. You will listen to the voice of God, and you will guard all of God's commands. What just changed? You're, you're doing Shmira now. You were never doing Shmira beforehand. You'll listen to the voice of God to guard God's commands. Guarding and doing, going back to Eden, there were two ways in which we were supposed to relate to God's commands in the original Eden. And now, in the latter-day Eden, in Israel, there's two ways that we listen to God's commands. We respond to God's commands, too, with the same thing. Avoda, doing the commands, but also guarding the commands. And, you know, we talked about this, which is that in the meantime, we had these angels who were the guarders of the tree, the special tree. Why were they the guardians of the tree? Because mm -hmm. God was worried that we would misappropriate the thing that we were guarding. We would stretch out our hand to take the very thing that we were guarding, and we would destroy the tree. And when do we know that we've made it? When God trusts us to be the new angels. When God says, you're the guardians now. Beautiful. It, it gives new new meaning to the word lishmor mitzvot chukim, right? So it's like, are you keeping the laws, right? It's not so much like you're doing all the laws, you're keeping them, right? Somehow um, there's a relationship with these laws. Somehow you're you're the custodian of them, you're the guardian of them. Uh, you bring them forth into this world and, and you're angelic beings almost uh, in your ability to do so. So this is Parshat Atshuva. This is really part one of chapter 30. Um, it didn't, these, this is the lead up to the verses that I first saw the ones that suggested that the tree of life and the tree of knowledge are the same tree. But what you're seeing is, is that the antecedents to those verses is a whole theory of tshuva based upon the two facets of this tree, right? How you relate to the tree of life aspect of it, and then how you relate to the tree of knowledge aspect of it. So if you keep on reading, we then have two more sections to the parsha. The next is verses 11 through 14. 11 to 14 is where Moshe says, don't get intimidated by this thing called the Torah. This mitzvah, as I've told you today, it's not so far away. It's not in heaven anymore that you should say who would go up to heaven, right? And then and bring it down and do it. It's not on the other side of an ocean that you should say, who's going to cross the ocean? We already crossed the ocean. We already split a sea. It's very, very close to you. right? It's close to you and you're able to do it. And therefore, and this is the third and final section, these are the verses when Moshe is basically telling you what the trees were back in the garden. And he's saying in this new garden in Israel, the trees are here too. But the trees don't look like trees anymore. The trees now look like God's word. So now look and you'll see. My theory is, is that God is that, is that Moshe will begin by presenting a world in which you look at the tree from both angles and will then isolate the tree of life angle of the tree, almost as, as if all of chapter 30 is one large chiasm. If you think about Parsha Tshuva, Parsha Tshuva began by saying, okay, so there's this tree of life kind of thing that you need to just listen to God's voice and just don't, don't worry about actions. And then once you're ready, there's also this tree of knowledge thing that you're going to have to do. And you're going to have to blend them together so that you have the heart and the mind and the actions. And that's when your journey is complete, when you have both of them. And then much is going to come out and deconstruct it for you and say, you see, here's this thing. It's called the Torah. It's both of them, right? But the essence is this tree of life thing, right? It's fundamentally a tree of life. So watch how that goes as you begin to read Re'enat Adif
Reinatati Vefanecha Yom. Before uh, see, I have placed before you today Etachaim Vetatov, the life and the good, Vetamavet Vetara, and the death and the evil. Right? So these trees have sort of mixed together. It's not, hey, I have placed before you Etachaim Etamavet, Etatov Vetara. It's I've given you life and good and bad and, and evil. And they're sort of being presented as one. Mm-hmm. Right? You can view it as Tov, you can view it as Chaim. Both of them are true. Good. Uh, I'm commanding you today to love God, uh, to go in his derech. But notice the blending of the trees, right? There's the, is this idea of commands, but the command is to love. Right? In a tree of life only world, there would just be love. There's no commands. I'm not following these dictates. I'm just, what does my heart say? Once I'm living in a world where, in a post tree of knowledge world, where I've, I've made it through the Parsha Datshuva, right? So now I'm in a situation where I can understand that, you know what, going forward, you know, there are expectations. And one of them is that I'm going to, that, that my heart should stay in the right place, right? There is this command to love God. But it's paradoxically, that's not the way you get into that command. Right? You've got to find your way to love without the command. Keep on going. Really, Shmor mitzvotav, right? And there, Shmira again, you're keeping his mitzvos. Vechukotav mishpatav. Vechayita, life. Veravita, uh, multiplicity. Uverachacha, Hashem elokacha, ba'aretz asheratab Hashem elorishta. And God will bless you in the land that you go there to inherit. It. Inherit. The im yifne levavcha, and if your heart uh, turns or turns away, the lo tishman, you won't hear. V'nidachta v'hishtachavita lelohim acherim v'avadatam, right? And if you um, get uh, drawn away and you bow down to other gods and you serve them, he gadati lachem hayom ki avod tovidun. Um, I, I'm telling you today um, that you will be surely destroyed. Lo tarichun yami maldama, right? The, uh, your days on the the earth will not be lengthened. Asher ata over etayardain, right? That land that you're crossing the Jordan to, lavo shama lerishta to inherit. If you get seduced into idolatry, it's all going to go south. What you're doing is you're severing the bonds of the relationship. Then what God is telling you is, I actually will not sever those bonds, but you'll be back in exile and we'll have to go through this process again. So interestingly, it's not the end of our relationship but it will be the end for a time of your ability to be together in this intimate place with me in the land. Yeah, it's it's telling you that exile can come again. I am uh, bringing the heavens and the earth as witness. I have placed life and death before you. The blessing and the curse. And you should choose life. Now slow down. What is not here in the verse? Yeah, there is no tree of knowledge. I don't see any good and evil language here. Yep. This is just what the tree is. Right? At bottom, it's a tree of life. Its fruits may have tree of knowledge aspect. But let's talk about what the tree is. Right? The same idea as how you get into Chuba. What is this tree? A it's a, it is a tree of life. Right? Right? And therefore choose the life that it offers you. Why? Right? To love God. What word is missing? Compared to the first time around in verse 16. There's no command anymore. There's no command. There's just love. Choose life to love God. And to hear his voice, only hear his voice. No, is there anything about doing any mitzvahs? No, you're just clinging to him. Listening to his voice and clinging to him. How are you supposed to relate to the tree of life? Hold on to it. So you hold on to God. Why? Look at the next words. He's the source of your life. He's your life. He is your life. You know, just, I, I added source. He is your life. It's not because you should live. Because you'll get life. That's not why. It's because he is your life. That's why you do this. And that's the proper relationship to the tree of life. The tree of life is 
a connection to your source, and therefore it's an end unto itself. The real reason why you connect to the tree of life is because kihu chayacha, because you realize he is your life, ba'orachemacha, the length of your days. In the nechmad lemare way of looking at things, you can sort of appreciate um, there's a quality distinction here. It's not a, it's not about actions or what you get. Is that you can appreciate God uh, or a way of interacting with God in His world purely as your life, right? Uh, in the same way that you would look at a tree not for what it can do for you, but purely to enjoy the tree. That really does feel like what this last verse is saying: is it's not if this then that. It's not do this so that it is. Look at the end of the day, guys. There's no mitzvah here. Just love God, listen to His voice, cling to Him. He's your life. He's, you know, orach yamecha. He's, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. So if the beginning of the chapter is how to use these ideas to come back to God, the end of the chapter is how to stay in connection with God with these ideas. This is quite stunning. And this is really it. This is the the, the end of the Torah, right? Like this is, it, it's kind of a, a funny way to end what many people understand as a book of laws. Right? Is it, it's sort of Moshe boils it down and says, sure, laws, you can listen to the laws, but at the end of the day, it's a tree of life. It is a tree of life, and should you understand that well enough, you can get to those fruits, and then your experience of it will be complete. Right? And, um, and that's true whether we're in the garden or whether we're in the latter day garden. But if we can properly transplant the tree of life, we can nurture it to the point where it can, and we can enjoy those fruits, but the key to it is not to lose that connection to the tree of life, which is its elusive essence. Beautiful. Can I just ask you one more question? Side question? Sure. The chapter talks about Shav constantly, and it, and it ends with um, God is your life, or Lashevet al Hashem Labotacha. And your days will be lengthened to dwell securely on the land that God swore to your fathers. What do you make of the connection between Shav returning and Shevet dwelling securely? Do you think that those ideas have some connection? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I think it's exactly the idea that you and I were just talking about, right? Verse 20 is appropriating the theme of Shav one last time to make its point at the end of what is a grand chiasm. In other words, I will show you in the beginning, starting from a position of exile, how to use the ideas of tree of life and tree of knowledge to come back to God. And shove in that context means to come back to God. But at the second part of the chiasm, it's, I will show you once you have that relationship established, how you maintain it. Once I've got things working, once I'm in the land and once I have a decent relationship with God, then I sort of have to keep the cylinders going Right, and I'm living a tree of knowledge, tree of life world. Every once in a while, I have to sort of dip into this reservoir, almost of Shabbos, and and reinvigorate myself with this connection to source and tree of life, right? In order to do what La Shevet now doesn't mean to return, but it means just to exist, just to dwell. And the second half mm-hmm. of thirty is what does it mean to dwell with God, and the first half of thirty is what does it mean to start from scratch and return to God. Do you think that if the first half of the chapter is you in the world of fragmentation, right? And so when you're in a world of duality, a world where it's hard to see these trees as anything but two, that um, the act of returning is, is sort of like shav is something that you do in a world of fragmentation. But what that looks like in a world of unity is la shevet, right? in a world of of oneness. Um, the, the same thing that returning is ends up being dwelling? Hmm. That's a very deep idea. I think I'm going to have to meditate on that for a long time. (laughs) (laughs) I hope we've left you with much to meditate on as well. And if we have, please share your thoughts with us. There's a link in the description you can use to leave us a voice note. I'd love to know how any and all the ideas we've been discussing have made their way into your life. Until our next adventure, thanks for listening. It's truly been Nechamad. A pleasure. Keep an eye out for a whole new season of A Book Like No Other coming soon. Or don't keep an eye out. This is the 21st century. Just subscribe. 
Seriously, this is the moment to subscribe. So as soon as we're back, you'll know. And if you're excited for many more seasons of this podcast, please, please rate us, write a review, share with your friends. This series, like the tree of life, needs your love to grow. A Book Like No Other is a product of Aleph Beta, a nonprofit dedicated to helping people fall in love with Torah. Visit alephbeta.org for hundreds of more deep dive audios and beautifully animated videos on nearly every biblical text. If you're enjoying this podcast, I hope you'll find a lot there that speaks to you. This episode was recorded by Rabbi David Foreman and me, Imu Shalev. It was edited by Tikva Hecht with additional edits by Evan Wiener. Audio editing was done by Hilary Gutman. Additional audio editing was done by Vikal Sharma. A book like no other's senior editor is Tikva Hecht. Adina Blausin keeps all the parts moving. <laughs> <laughs>